Welcome to our class on the study of the book of Hebrews. Now, if you were as I were when I was younger, I was somewhat fearful of the book of Hebrews because almost everyone said, well, you can't understand the book of Hebrews unless you know all about the Old Testament law and the sacrifices and so forth. But really, that's not true. The book of Hebrews is one of the simplest books in your New Testament. Very easy to understand and not much there to have to be explained. As a matter of fact, it is so simple. Over the 40 years that I've spent in the Bible conference ministry, I have taught the book of Hebrews very few times simply because I felt sort of silly for doing it because it was so simple. But we're going to take the time to go through the book of Hebrews. It, it's a very simple book. It has one central theme throughout it. Now, these Jewish believers had been believers for some time and had been uh, faithful to a degree, and yet because of persecution from their fellow Jews, they were considering going back into Judaism. And so this epistle was written to show them that Christ and Christianity is superior to what you had in Judaism. And therefore, the uh, entire book is an admonition to go on and be faithful because what you have is superior. Now that is made very evident for us right in the very last chapter, chapter 13, and verse 22. Now, after he completed the epistle in verses 22 through 25, which is the end of the, of the book, he says this, Now the God of peace, uh, excuse me, I'm in uh, verse 20, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer or allow or bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Now he says the exhortation, there is no immediate exhortation right here. What he's talking about is the message of the entire epistle. So in this epistle, if we divide it, uh, you have two divisions in the epistle. Uh, as we outline it, say Roman number one and two and so forth, there's only two points within it. And first of all, it says Christ, the founder of Christianity, is superior to the founders of Judaism. And that's in 1, 1 through 10, 18. And then secondly, Christ, the founder of Christianity, being superior to the founders of Judaism, then we have a greater encouragement to go on and be faithful. And that you find in 1019 through the remainder of the book. So it's all one admonition and with many reasons for doing so. Now, let us begin our study. And in this session, we're going to cover the first two chapters. And in it, we're going to see that what you have in Christianity is superior to the prophets of the Old Testament, and it's superior to the angels. Now, the first point of the book is this. Christ, the founder of Christianity, is superior to the founders of Judaism in 1, 1 through 10, 18. Now, the first point under this is the fact that he is superior to the prophets, as we find in the first three verses of chapter 1. Now, notice the beginning, and I admonish you now as normal, Keep your Bible open and follow word for word. You'll get far more out of it if you will do that. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, this word God at the beginning actually uh, follows the word divers manners, if we would understand it. Then notice the, the word who is in italics. At sundry times is literally in many parts. In many parts. Then the phrase, in divers manners, which is also just one word in the Greek, is in, in many ways. So he says, in many parts and in many ways, God spake. It is an Arius participle which renders, having spoken in times past, that is, of old, in old days, unto the fathers, uh, by means of the prophets, by or in the prophets. So God in old times spoke in the prophets. So we see that he appeared to the prophets because the prophets are spokesmen of the revelation of God, as we see here in verse 1. So they only spoke what was revealed to them by God. And not only did we see that the prophets are the spokesmen of revelation, but the Son, Jesus Christ the Son, is the revelation of the spokesman, as we see in verses 2 and 3. Now, notice several things here that's pointed out in this very short portion. There's a great deal that's said. 
Now he's speaking of this God who in times old, of times past, spoke through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by or in the realm or sphere of his Son. Now he's spoken to us now in his Son. And uh, he says, first of all, that he is the heir of all things. Now notice how great he's pointing out the Son is right away to point out that what they have in Christ is far superior to what they had in Judaism. Uh, Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So God the Father appointed Christ to be the heir of all things, and so that is a great position to have. He inherits all things that are created. But not only that, he's the creator of all things. Uh, He says, by, dear, by means of or through whom also he made the worlds are the ages, as we find in the Gospel of John chapter 1 that Christ created. We find in Colossians chapter 1 that he was the creator of all things. And throughout the word of God, this truth is pointed out. So Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. He is the creator of all things. But also we find that he is the manifestation of God. Notice in verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now notice that word brightness. That word brightness speaks of an outraying. What it's talking about is this. It's rays of light uh, that are coming out from the original body. Rays of light coming out from the original body and forming a similar light body itself. Uh, So the the illustration of that is somewhat like what you're looking at now. These lights and cameras on me, and then you put it on the player, and that light shines forth, and you see an image of me as I am. Now, that's not a perfect illustration, but it gives you some idea of what he's talking about here, that Jesus Christ was the outraying that body that came from God himself shining forth, and Christ was the like body of that which sent forth the light. So it says, who being the outraying of his glory, of the glory of him, and the express image of his person. Now that phrase express image literally means an exact reproduction of his essence. So he's an exact reproduction of the very essence of God. So Jesus Christ was a manifestation of God, a very absolute God. He was fully God and not just a a representation of him. Now when we talk about son, it's not the same thing that we think of as a father having a son. We don't have time to go into that discussion. Now notice also he still says in this passage that he's not only the heir of all things, the creator of all things, and the manifestation of God, but he says he's the sustainer of all things because he says, and upholding or maintaining all things by the word, the spoken word of his power. We're told also elsewhere, especially in Colossians 1, that he is the one who holds all things together. He's the sustainer of all of creation, not only the one that created it, but he's the one that holds it all together. And then furthermore, we see that he is the redeemer. Uh, So he says, he's the sustainer of all things, and when he had by himself purged our sins. The word purged means made purification. He by himself, he made purification for our sins. So therefore, having purified us by his redeeming work upon the cross and paying the penalty demanded by the justice of God, then we are purified, we are redeemed to become the children of God. So he's the redeemer. And furthermore, he is the high priest. Now, after he had purged our sins... Uh, He sat down on the right hand of the majesty uh, on high, or in the highest of places. So he sat down on the right hand of the majesty, that is of God, in the very highest of places. So he was the high priest in that position, and there to make intercession for all the saints. So we see in these first three verses that he is superior to the prophets, Uh, because the prophets were the spokesmen of revelation, but Jesus Christ was that revelation that was spoken of through the prophets. Now, beginning in verse 4, and going all the way down through chapter 2, 
we see that he is superior to the angels as well. And he's superior to the angels in a great variety of ways. Now, notice first of all, he has a better name than the angels in verses 4 and 5. Being made, that is, it's an Arius participle, having been made so much better or superior than the angels. Now notice, he was made one to be far superior to the angels, so he's better than they are, as he hath by inheritance obtained, or literally, as he hath inherited a more excellent name than they. He inherited a more excellent name than the angels did. And uh, he says, that is true, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, quote, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now when did God ever say that to an angel? But he did say it concerning his son Jesus Christ in Psalm 2-7. And again, uh, when did he ever say this to an angel? I will be unto him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's in 2 Samuel 7, 14. Now, he has a much better name than the angels in a better position. And then we find, furthermore, he is the subject of worship, and the angels are the worshipers, as we see in verse 6. And again, our, uh, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, or into the a habitable world, he saith, and now he quotes again, and let all the angels of God worship him. So he's the subject of worship, and the angels are those who worship him, and God said, let all the angels worship him. And then again, he's the Lord that the angels obey, in verse 7. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers, that is, angels are the ministering spirits, a flame of fire, Psalm 104 and verse 4. So they are ministering servants and spirits who serve the Lord in many ways. Then in verses 8 and 9, he has an eternal throne above all others, in verses 8 and 9. But unto the Son, he saith, as opposed to what was said to the angels, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, is unto the ages of the ages. So he says, your throne, and speaking of Christ, he said, Thy throne, O God, is unto the ages of the ages. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity or lawlessness. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows or thy companions. Psalm 45, verses uh, 6 through 9. So he has an eternal throne as well, which the angels definitely do not have. And again, he states in verse 10 that he is the creator. And verse 10, he quotes again and says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Again, this is speaking of the person of Christ and quoting from statements of the Old Testament. He's the one that created all things and brought all things into existence, and they're the works of his hands. And then we find in verses 11 and 12 that he is unchangeable. Uh, they, that is, the angels, and all of this creation, the, this creation shall perish. All of this creation that was created by your hands shall perish, but thou remainest. In other words, they're going to pass away into nothingness one of these days, but yet Christ is going to remain, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. That is, old with wear, not time. As doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold or roll them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail or shall not end. Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. So he's an unchangeable God. The creation itself will pass away, it will be changed, and it will be brought in a new creation of things in which is no defilement, nor sin, nor corruption. But Christ remains the same through all eternity. And then, in uh, the seventh place here, we see is, he is seated at God's right hand. 
while the angels are ministering spirits in verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time? Now, when did he ever say this to an angel? Sit on my right hand and I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110, verse 1. When did he ever say that to an angel? But he did say it to Christ. Are they not all ministering spirits? They are publicly ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs or who are about to inherit salvation. So the angels are ministering spirits unto human beings. Now, as we begin in chapter 2, we see here that we have, first of all, an admonition in light of this fact that he has appeared to the prophets, he has appeared to the angels, and therefore we have an admonition in these four verses. Uh, and in these four verses he says, we are to give heed to the words of Christ in view of the fact of how great he is. Now notice what he says here. Uh, therefore, therefore because Christ and Christianity is superior to Judaism in every way, uh, especially in respect to the prophets and the angels, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed. Now notice that phrase, more earnest heed. That renders abundant heed. We are to hold ourselves to the things that are true concerning Christ and Christianity to the things which we have heard, or the things having heard. So we ought to give a heed to those things that we've heard and we've understood in the things of Christianity. We give abundant heed to them. Uh, why? Lest at any time we should let them slip, or we may be drifted right on by, or we may be run by, passed by these things. We give heed to them lest they go right on by us. And I'm afraid this is the truth of too many people today who are saved. They're saved, but they... Stand aside and let the things of God pass them right on by and never get involved with an active Christianity and a living of the things of the Word of God. Now notice he says, we ought to give heed to these things we have heard in the teachings of Christ, lest the things of him just pass us right on by. Uh, for if the word spoken or having been spoken by angels was steadfast, it was firm, dependable, reliable, guaranteed, assured to be true, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, and it did, how shall we escape? How shall we flee out away from it? How are we going to get out of it? We as believers now, now he's not talking about unsaved people, he's talking about the believers, the, especially these Jewish believers, and any other believer, how are we going to flee out away from it? Uh, having neglected so great salvation. It doesn't mean neglected to get saved, but neglecting the great salvation that we have in Christ, which is far superior in every way as we have seen in the preceding verses in chapter 1. Uh, this same salvation which at the first, having begun to be spoken by the Lord, that is the Lord Christ himself talked about it in his own life and ministry, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, that is the apostles, they taught the same message of redemption that Christ talked about. God also bearing them witness, so God bore witness of what the apostles were teaching in the early church, how both by signs and wonders and with divers miracles or various acts of power, and by gifts or distributions literally of the Holy Spirit according to his will, not to our will and we desired. And this same thing is expressed for us in the first epistle to the Corinthians, that he distributes these gifts by the Spirit as he willeth and not as we will. Now, he said, seeing how great Christ is and the salvation that we have in him, we ought to give heed to the things that are taught concerning it, lest those things pass us by. And if we go on and let them pass us by, how are we going to escape the judgment of it and the chastisement that may come as a result? Now, he continues t telling us how Christ is superior to, to, the, to the angels because he is the ruler of the messianic kingdom in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Now, notice what he says here in verse 5. 
For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world, that is, the habitable world, to come. Or, to come is a present participle, which is coming. Now, we're already in a world, but there is another world that's coming, which is that millennial world. And he says, unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world that is coming, whereof we speak. We speak of that coming reign of Christ upon the earth in the millennium, and he does not ever say anything about that being in subjection to the angels. But one in a certain place testified, saying, in other words, uh, he's talking about now in the book of Psalms 8, 4 through 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or of the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower, that is, for a little time, lower than the angels. Thou crowned him, that is, crowned him with the victor's crown, uh, with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. So Christ is the one that set over these things. Now notice he goes on to say, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, now, you put all things under subjection to him under his feet. Now notice, for in that he put all things in subjection under him or unto him, he left nothing that is not put under him. So when he says all things, that doesn't leave out anything. So there's not anything left out that was not put under the control and the authority of the power of Jesus Christ for that reigning in that world that is yet coming. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Put under is a perfect participle. We do not see all things having been and being put under him. That hasn't happened yet. It's not in subjection under Christ at this point. But what we see now is Jesus. We just see the person of Jesus Christ now who was made another perfect participle, who having been and being made a little lower, that is for a little while, a little time lower than the angels, that is for that time that he came to earth to have to give himself, made in the image of man, now was made a little, for a little while lower than the angels, why? For the suffering of death or the death, that is that separation from God, so that we would not have to be separated from him, crowned, another perfect participle, uh, having been crowned, that is, with the victor's crown, with glory and honor, uh, that he, by the grace of God, now get what this says, should taste death for every man. That leaves no one out. He tasted of death, of a separation from God on behalf of every man, every human being, every person of all time from Adam to the end of time. He paid the penalty for all with no one being left out. Now, uh, he should taste death for every man. And every simply means every and no other thought can be made from it. So we see that he's the ruler of the Messianic kingdom and the one who is the redeemer of all mankind. And that takes us into the, what is being stated in the following verses, in verses 10 through 18, that he is the redeemer of all men. Now he just made that statement. He tasted of death for every man. For it became him, it was becoming of him. For whom are all things, now, uh, for on account of him are all things because we have seen a couple of statements already in chapter 1 that he created all things. He brought them into existence. And by means of or through whom are all things, another way of stating that it was through him that they were created and brought into existence, it was becoming of him in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. Now that phrase, uh, to make their captain salvation perfect, the word uh, to make perfect would be better brought together as one statement, to make perfect the captain, that is the chief ruler uh, of their salvation, uh, make perfect the chief ruler of their salvation, how? Through suffering. Now, he was perfected through the suffering of all things on our behalf for the penalty of sin. For both 
He that sanctified, that's a present participle. For both he that is sanctifying and they who are sanctified, another present participle, they who are being sanctified. So the one who is doing the sanctifying are setting apart, and the ones who are being sanctified are set apart, are all uh, out of or out from one. The word of here is the word ek, ek, which means out of or out from. We are all out from God. He was out from God. We're out from God as well in that new birth through him. For which cause he is not ashamed to call and to continue to call them brethren. So Jesus Christ is not ashamed in the least to call us his brethren in these things. Uh, now how do we get that saying? Now here is what he said. Uh, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, or literally the assembly, the ecclesia of the assembly, will I sing praise unto thee. Psalm 22, 22. And again, it is stated in the Old Testament scriptures, I will put my trust on him. That is, in or the word is epi upon him. I will put my trust. Put my trust is one word. It's an heirs part of part of simple, I will, having put my trust on him. So I'll give my praise unto him, having put my trust upon him. And again, and he quotes again from, from uh, Isaiah 8.18, Behold, quote, I and the children which God hath given me. Now he says they are mine, and therefore I'm not ashamed to call them brethren. For as much then as the children are partakers, they are common sharers of flesh and blood. That is, all, all of us now are common sharers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same. He likewise, in the same manner, alongside with, he took part in or he took hold with the same, that is, with flesh and blood. Now, we being in flesh and blood, he took hold and part of flesh and blood himself. And he was God manifest in the flesh, as we're told in John chapter 1. Why? That through the death, that is, from that separation from God, he might destroy, or that word destroy means render powerless, render inoperative or powerless, him who having the power or the authority of the death, that is, the devil. Now, the devil having authority and power over man takes them to that eternal second death, that is, that second separation from God into the eternal lake of fire. But Christ suffered that for us and redeemed us from that separation, being separated on our behalf. And he says, and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, that is, subject to the bondage of Satan and death, so we were delivered from that. For truly, verily or truly, uh, he took, uh, he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now that's a little bit of a, a confusing translation in the way here, but yet if you look at it clearly, you can see exactly what it is saying, even in your English. So he, he did not take part of, of the substance of angels, but he took on the substance of human beings as Abraham was. So he says, for truly uh, he taketh not hold on angels, but he took hold on the seed of Abraham, or the sense of what he is saying is this, for truly he giveth his aid not to angels, but to the seed of Abraham, that is to human beings of flesh and blood. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him, it was becoming of him, to be made like unto his brethren. So, he became like unto us. He was not identical to us, but he was like the likeness of mankind, as we're told in uh, the book of Philippians, chapter 2. He was like unto man. Now, that declares similarity but denies sameness. 
he was had the similarity of mankind. He had human flesh just as human as we are, but he was not identical because in his flesh he did not have a sinful nature. He was as Adam was before Adam sinned, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 15. He was the second Adam. Now, uh, so in all things it behooved him, it was becoming of him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful that is a compassionate and faithful high priest in things pertaining unto God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now notice that word reconciliation. That word reconciliation is the word for propitiation and that means that which makes amends for, that which completely appeases, that which totally satisfies the justice of God as we're told in the first epistle of John. Uh, chapter 2, the first two verses in 1 John 4.10. Now, there we are told that he is the propitiation, the one that makes amends for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is, all mankind. He made amends unto God on behalf of all. And since Christ did that, the only thing left for us to be saved and be a partaker of it is to believe it, to trust it, to accept it as a fact, because he's already paid the penalty. And so our salvation then is by faith, by believing God. So he says he was a high priest in things pertaining unto God to make reconciliation or propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being or having been tempted, that is, he was tempted while he was on earth, but yet never did yield to any one temptation. He is able to succor, he is able to help them who are being tempted. Them that are tempted, a present participle, those who are being tempted. He's able to help us because he's gone all the way through the temptation from beginning to end and never have yielded. We many times are tempted and start and before we get all the way through. We yield in many cases. Sometimes we go through without it. Sometimes we don't. But he is able to help us because he has been tempted in all points like as we are, as we're told elsewhere in this epistle. Now, I want you to notice we're looking at the fact that Christ the founder of Christianity is superior to the founders of Judaism. And in this session, he has pointed out two ways in which that's true. He is superior to the prophets because the prophets are the spokesmen of revelation. Jesus Christ is the revelation of the spokesman. And this Jesus Christ who is revealed through the spokesman is the heir of all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the manifestation of God and the sustainer of all things that are created. He's the redeemer and the high priest. But also... He's not only superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels in 1, 4 through 2, 18. He has a better name than the angels. He is subject, he's the subject of worship while the angels are the worshipers. He's the Lord whom the angels obey and serve. Uh, he has an eternal throne and he is the creator. He is unchangeable and he is seated at God's right hand and they are ministering servants, those who are to be heirs of salvation. He's the ruler of the messianic kingdom and he's the redeemer of all mankind. And being the redeemer of all mankind, as Jewish believers you should be faithful and go on because what you have in Christ and Christianity is superior to anything you had in Judaism or have in Judaism. Now, as we continue in the lesson tomorrow, starting in chapter 3, we will see that he's not only superior to the prophets and to the angels, but he is far superior to Moses in a great variety of ways. Be with us and keep your Bible open.